everybody. I am Sari Custer, Chief Science and Curiosity Officer for Arizona Science Center, also known as Sari on Science for Arizona Science Center. And I am so excited to have you all here tonight for our first Science of Cooking ceviche. We're joined tonight by our great partners over at M Culinary Concepts. So we've got Chef Michael DiMaria, who's going to run us through a couple of great ceviche recipes while I talk about the science. So of course, due to a technical difficulty and a little uh, mishap with the recording button, we missed just the first intro here and Chef Michael adding in our, um, our meat ingredients, our, our shellfish and our fish. So um, you've only missed that, but we're gonna jump right in. Thanks for joining us tonight and I hope you guys enjoy the science of cooking. To them are caught from the ocean and then they found out through experimental, hey, lime juice cooks this through acid. So I would stay and just do fresh fish. So that brings us right into this recipe, which has got scallops and shrimp. All right, we're gonna put that down on the side for now. Uh, and as you look through your recipes, uh, we're gonna use a measuring spoon. I typically don't, but for you guys, I'm measuring spoon away. Uh, we are doing uh, two tablespoons of cilantro, chopped cilantro, Italian parsley, forget about it. All right. And then uh, on here, we have uh, one uh, tablespoon of jalapeno. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's do a little knife demo, too. All right, jalapenos, jalapeno peppers. Now, you guys, if you really like it hot, you can use other peppers. Uh, there's so many, scotch bonnet, anaheim. You can use all different kinds of peppers with different heat ratios. There's a Scoville unit, Siri. This, what's about, what is a Scoville unit? And tell them about that as as this, as as uh, the scientist. Over. All right. So Scoville units are all about heat and that heat index. And uh, if I recall properly, here it's also about capsaicin levels in pe pepper um, and that receptor for how intense that heat flavor is. That's right. So you can make it super spicy, and this actually makes it sort of medium. And if you want to go less spicy, you can use like an Anaheim uh, chili. And if you don't want any spice at all, go with like bell peppers. So now let's talk about knives and what we're doing here, because this is the most important thing, because as you can see right here, we have a lot of knife work we've done, a lot of mincing and dicing. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I prefer a 10 inch French knife. This knife is a Forstner. It's slightly serrated. And when you hold a knife, let's talk about that. Don't ever hold a knife just by the handle or like uh, with your, uh, pointer finger sticking out. You want to actually scooch up on the knife and make sure you hold it so that you can control the blade like that just by your hand and how it turns. Now we have a pepper. Now the one thing about the pepper is do not touch your eyes when you uh, cut, after you cut this pepper because that uh, all that heat will go into your eyes and burn your eyes, okay? So what we did is we chopped both ends and then we, we uh, took out one piece to get, as you can see, no seeds and nothing nice and flat. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take our knife and we're gonna use our hand like a crab, a crab, and it's gonna go right over the top. Now have the, have the blade here. So now you can see this little V down here. This is where people, they like to hold it like this and then chop and then you're gonna cut your thumb. So what I do is I have my fingers like this. I have my knife. I literally slice through, I try to slice, okay? Then as I put them into uh, this nice little row, I take them and again, you can see the V down here. My thumb is tucked under and you can see that I slice like this. Some people like to do the rocker motion. I think that sometimes crushes the pepper, okay? So again, I like to do the slice through so that you can get a nice cut on there. So that's what we have with the peppers. So we'll add that right into our pepper uh, prep or mise en place, everything in its place. And we'll go to the measuring unit of one tablespoon of peppers, okay? We're gonna add that in. All right, the next thing is uh, chopped scallions. So we're gonna take our scallions over here. We have chopped scallions. We're gonna put one tablespoon chopped scallions. We have red onions, red onions. This is a big one. So let's go back to the knife demo, please. And we will have a nice peeled red onion. As you can see, 
I cut both sides off, cut it in half. I have a beautiful red onion. So what I like to do now is take my knife, hold it flat, move the onion to the end. And as you can see here, we're just gonna cut in and we're gonna make several. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven cuts. Take it on the side. Take the tip of your knife and slice down through. See, it gets, it gets all of all those pieces in there. Take any of the big ones out. And then you can see what I'm doing. I'm pushing the knife through the onion. Okay, I'm slicing through. And that's how you get your red onions, okay? All right, so uh, I know this, we'll put, go well, ahead. I say this is a time for that question because it hasn't come up and I'm surprised, but uh, we've got some folks saying, I don't like onions and then onions make me cry. So I think it's time to talk about why do onions make you cry? Why, tell us Siri, how do, why do onions make us cry? All right, so onions are amazing. Uh, they actually release a really cool, actually two different chemicals, an enzyme and this crazy chemical that I even have to keep looking up because it's called synpropanethyl S oxide. It is crazy. It gets up, released after you cut it, gets into your eyes, mixes with the liquid in your eyes, that moisture, and turns into sulfenic acid. So you actually have acid production happening in your eyes from the vapors from that onion. And that's the burning you feel because it starts to irritate your tear ducts, hence the tears. So um, it's a really complex process. Isn't that insane? Yes, it is. I remember working at the Rich Carlton in a small room. We used to slice onions every day. We used to take plastic wrap and put it around our eyes and tie it in the back and keep working. That's what we used to do in the old days. All right, so let's go back to the recipe. Well, uh, and, and the let ahead. me throw in really quickly because there is a question that it says, is it true that burning a candle while cutting helps make you not cry so much? Um, I honestly don't know that burning a candle would make a difference. Um, maybe helping to move the air around a little more with that heat production. Um, I guess try it out and let us know if that works. Um, some other methods would be to use goggles. Um, or even putting in, uh, Chef Michael, I'd love your opinion on this. A lot of people say to put your onions in the refrigerator for a few minutes first. Um, and yeah, that, that works. Yeah. That works too. That's good. All right, hey, let's get back to the recipe. I just added in the olive oil. And I will tell you, I'm using some of my favorite olive oil, Frantoia. It's from Sicily. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, non-grassy olive oil. If you guys get an opportunity to market to pick some of this up, you'll love it. Frantoia. Love it or your own favorite, whatever you like. Let's talk about the tomato, because so, what we want to do is- I'm so yeah, sorry, can we jump Sarah. back to the olive oil? Another question that came up, what does extra virgin mean when it comes to olive oil? What does that mean? Well, the extra virgin means that that is the first press of the barrel. So you're getting the first press of the barrel right there, okay? So squeezing the fat, the first press of squeezing the fat from the olive fruits, from the olive fruits. You product. got it. Beautiful. All right, let's go to the tomato because I want to show you a little different way. I don't know if most folks know this. So we're using Roma tomatoes. And what I do is I take the top and the bottom off so it sits nice and, uh, nice and flat. And really all we want is this outer piece of the tomato. And you can do all four sections of it. And you can see that we don't have anything on there, no seeds, no, uh, no juice. And then again, you know, we can slice through like this, slice this way, and then get our tomatoes down because everything needs to be nicely diced, uh, you know, for palatability on, the, on your mouth there when you're eating this so that you don't have a, a, whole, uh, a whole mouth of tomatoes. So now we've got our tomatoes, all right? So that's how you do the tomatoes. We'll do some more knife stuff in, uh, on the next dish. Uh, right. So now we have our minced garlic which we're gonna do a, uh, what does it say here? Half of a teaspoon. So we're gonna go with a half a teaspoon of garlic. And if you like more, kick it up. Uh, we're gonna go with uh, some salt. Listen, it says uh, one table, uh, one teaspoon. I like to make sure, come focus in on my fingers. When you put salt into something, you should always crack it. I use coarse, uh, kosher salt and it kind of releases the salt. You never want to shake anything in because boom, somebody could hit you or just too much salt goes in, it's really a problem. Always have it go through your fingertips, all right? Chef and Michael, then the last, 
Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. Can we talk about salt real quick? Uh, because yeah. salt comes up in a lot of different dishes. And, um, you know, why do we always use salt? Uh, we hear it as a, a flavor enhancer. What does that mean? Well, you know, um, salt itself uh, on your palate where you taste for salt is on the tip of your tongue. So it's part of, uh, you know, a body experience. You could, you could taste for the salt. You taste something bland, you're never going to taste it on the tip of your tongue. That's how you know there's enough salt. And salt uh, extracts the flavors uh, from most foods. Okay? Awesome. And then scientifically on the other side of that, I know I see in the comments here people talking about um, adding salt. Um, so yes, you can always add a little more salt if that's to your taste. Um, so, you know, you can use it sparingly at first. Um, too much salt in your diet can lead to some other heart problems and whatnot down the road. So just be conscious of that, but um, not necessarily in the amounts we're talking about for this particular dish. So uh, a little and, science and, there for you. Yeah. And also I like to use uh, kosher salt. Uh, so, it, you know, it's kosher salt. You can use a little more of it. I don't use iodized. So you're going to have to use kosher. And this recipe is, does not use sea salt. All right. So now we're going to do about three quarters of a cup of lime juice. I've already squeezed the fresh lime juice. Please don't use that little yellow, uh, that little yellow lemon juice. All right. So now we're going to take our lime juice and you can bring the camera in and you can see how all of the, oh, we forgot to add the tomatoes. We diced them, but we forgot to add them. I threw One you off there, Seth. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I get thrown off quite often. No, just kidding. All right. So now I'll bring the camera in. Let's see this. You could see that, in theory, the recipe is supposed to be just to cover the fish with acid. So as you can see now, we just covered the fish. And now this needs about 20, 30 minutes uh, to macerate and uh, for everything, uh, for the denature de de to happen and to start to cook that fish, okay? So I'm going to put this on the side. And then through the magic of TV, we already made some about 30 minutes ago. And as you can see here, you can see that the scallops are turning white and the shrimp is turning red and white. So it's been sitting for 30 minutes and it's ready to go. Uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, give it a, a little taste. So I'm going to taste the shrimp and the scallops together. Mm. That looks awesome. That's really good. Nice. You can uh, you taste the acidity. I taste the salt in the front. Uh, um, you can taste all the peppers. So now let's talk about how we're going to plate this up. So everybody's very interested about that. Well, and, you know, can we jump in? Because you said the magic word, Chef Michael. You said denature. And, you know, maybe it's time to talk about that. Or do you want to do it, wait and plate it and then talk about it? No, why don't you go ahead while I grab some spoons here. You can tell them what that means. Awesome. I'm going to start on my presentation. All right. So while you're setting up for that, you know, Chef Michael said the denaturing process. So as we're cooking with acid tonight, it's all the citric acid that's in those limes. So limes and lemons uh, have the most citric acid. They're the most acidic citrus fruit. So the limes here are really acidic and that acid starts to mess with the proteins in the fish and the, the shellfish. So um, if anybody, you know, have you cooked an egg before or watched an egg cook? So when you crack it, you see the clear whites of that egg. And as you cook it on a stove, you see those whites, those clear whites start to turn opaque white. Well, this is kind of the same process, but without heat. This is using the acid to mess with those proteins and denaturing means those proteins start to unfold. And what happens then is that they start to link together a little bit differently. They trap water molecules in between them and they start to scatter light differently. And those water molecules and restructuring of those proteins is what starts to firm up the texture of those foods. So um, like an egg white getting firm or here, the shellfish and the fish starting to get firm. So that's why you're starting to see that white on the outside. So we haven't cooked with heat here. We've cooked, and I'll say cooked, with acid because technically this fish and shellfish is still technically raw. So you want to make sure you're, you're cooking with really, really good high quality ingredients here. All right. Well, good explanation. So you guys are back. I uh, chose to serve this uh, first course um, in, on spoons, as you can see. Come on down in. And this is something you can do for a reception, and it's very simple. You can put them on the spoons. I put some scallion tops on there. I'll show you how to do that in the next recipe, where we're going to use those more prevalently there. 
Uh, and then, you know, look at all these items here. I have all these fun little, uh, all these little fun dishes. So you can do uh, like a little espresso cup. Uh, take this, put it in there. This is great to pass around at a reception. Uh, they will love it. Um, you serve that with like a little teeny spoon. That would be fun. Check this little spoon out. So this is something else, uh, another style of presentation where you can do hors d'oeuvres. You can get these at like Sur La Table or something like that, one of your favorite kitchen stores. So we have that as a little, you know, amuse bite, just to amuse your palate. Boom, that's one. So as you can see, we have many of those little dishes. So you guys can make this super fun, however you want it to be, okay? I noticed right. the different shapes there too. I have to just throw out that I see a little bit of science, uh, a little math there in the shapes that you're using. So I love that kitchen connection right there. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're giving me all those science points because I never had science points like that before. You know, and Chef Michael, I realized we jumped in earlier without you even getting a chance to share how you, how else you see um, science and, and cooking combined. So that science in the kitchen. Uh, you know, that is so true. You know, one of, the, one of the most fun things when people say, what do you love to cook? You know what I love to cook? I like to make vinaigrettes and salads. So you have things like acid, oil, and protein all blended together, slowly adding the oil in a blender and becoming an emulsification. That's one. Uh, number two, cooking a really, really tough piece of meat like a shank or a rib in the oven, in water, braising. What does that do? It breaks down the tissues in the meat and makes it softer. Uh, and so, you know, and now cooking with acid, I mean, there's tons of things. And, and as we had our earlier conversations, I'm sure there's more and more things about science in the kitchen that uh, people can learn. So, hey, let's get right into the next recipe here. Uh, let's go a little faster. Do we have more time here? Are we okay? Or are we? I think we're all right. Let's keep going. And then all we'll right. do a... When we uh, finish this next one, we'll continue to ask a few questions, but we'll go faster through this one since we have an idea of all that science that's happening here. Um, and there are a few other questions that you might be able to answer along the way um, that are specific to this next recipe. Oh, here's one from the last one. How much lime juice um, in either recipe? Because it didn't have a, a specification. And now, uh, and, and quickly on that, amounts can be very important to the scientific community. Measuring yeah, really, amount. you're right. You know what, important. on this recipe, I have uh, three quarters of a cup. So it's three quarters of a cup, but here's the easy way to remember. Put the ingredients in your bowl and just fill enough lime juice to just, everything is just under the surface, not floating, just under the surface. That's a really easy way to, to remember, okay? And Chef Michael, when it comes to getting juice out of a fruit, now we're, we're damaging the cells to be able to release all that liquid. So do you have a special technique to be able to extra damage all those cells and juice your limes? Uh, no, I damage every cell possible. <laughs> and I use, I use a blender, you know, a, a juicer, and I get it all out of there, man. I get it going. So Love that's it. what I do. All right. Great. Because you got it's a lot of lines, to, a lot of juice to squeeze by hand. That would give you, I think, arthritis or carpal tunnel in your hand. All right. So we talked about cilantro, the Italian parsley, or the uh, Mexican or, or South American parsley. We have red onion here. Talk about one tablespoon of red onion. So we already talked about how to cut the onion. Uh, now we have avocado. We're going to save that to last. Uh, we're going to do Kalamata olives. Now, this is where I got a little bit off the track here. You know, the one thing I love about ceviche is you, uh, and all cooking, cooking is about adding and deleting a product to come up with your own recipe. That's how chefs are chefs. Some guys are herbal guys like me. I, I, I love herbs in all my cooking. Some guys are about spice and, 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 and big seasonings, big bold flavors. I know a lot of guys like that. Uh, but for me, I like to go herbal and herbaceous here. So uh, we've got our cilantro, our onions. I'm, at, I'm kicking this around a little bit. We have cucumber. Uh, we have two tablespoons of cucumber. And then I put in some olives. Now, I did use kalamata. I did like for uh, just because of the black in there. But, you know, it could be Spanish olives, which has the pimento in it. Chop those up as well. That's where you get your own little recipe from. So remember that. That makes you uh, your own chef. 
Uh, let's see. So we've got our cilantro, our onions, kalamatas, cucumbers. Uh, so this one, uh, I this one has no heat, so you can add heat, and you and you don't have to. So this one, I'm not putting any heat in. Um, Chef Michael, there's a question I'm, about if you can substitute capers for Kalamata olives in this uh, recipe. Yeah, you can substitute anything you want. You can put in chopped capers. You can substitute. That's why I did this recipe. It's a little bit off the, uh, the beaten path here. It doesn't have your classic items in it, uh, like the peppers and um, um, uh, the, the tomatoes and stuff like that. So we've got the, uh, the salmon. Uh, the artich, or, I'm sorry, the, the olives and the cucumbers. We're not putting in tomatoes, but we're putting in some uh, blood orange oil. This is fantastic stuff. So here in Arizona, we have Queen Creek olive milk. And this is a beautiful flavor. It's a blood orange olive oil. And it says one tablespoon of blood orange olive oil. This is just going to give this a nice little punch because you can't really smell it, but it's beautiful. Beautiful olive oil. All right, yeah. let's get to the avocado. Yes, Michael, there, there's a question about where you get the blood orange oil. It's made locally here, but is it uh, only available um, through online? Queen or is yeah, it online? Queen Creek okay. Olive Oil Mill. You can go to Queen Creek Olive Oil Mill, and I'm sure they'll sell you something online for sure. Okay. All right, so we're going to put a little salt in there. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to do a couple of uh, more, a couple more knife demos for you guys. All right, so lastly, we have an avocado. So the best way to take our half avocado is to cut down and go around. Take that off. Now, some people, do you know how to get that seed out of there? You obviously, you don't go straight through because you go right through your hand. You take the edge of the knife and you just tap it on, give it a click, and it pops right out. And that you can throw away, all right? Then we're gonna take our avocado, we're using a half. So if they're nice, this one's a slightly brown, they come off very gent very easily like that. They come off. Okay, that's better than any avocado peeling I've ever done in my life, you must be a pro. Well. Uh, it's not my first rodeo. <laughs> you know, and a <laughs> quick science note too, as we um, took the pit out of that olive, um, if you want just a fun science activity to do with it, you can take that pit, um, clean it off with a little bit of water, dry it with a paper towel, um, but then take a, a plastic bag and a damp paper towel, stick that pit in there, seal it, well, or excuse me, don't seal it, seal it, but just close it up, put it somewhere dark for a couple of days, and you can see if you can get it to actually uh, sprout, germinate. So just a little fun that you can have with it if you don't want to try it. It would take a really long time to grow an avocado tree, but I think it's something like 10 to 15 years before it'll grow fruit. But something to consider if you want to give it a go. All right. Well, thanks for that note. I was wondering all about that. Well, you remember we used to, in school, we used to put them on the ledge of the, of the window all the time, right? And yep. nobody ever knew what, the, what was happening. So I, I don't think I passed that science class. All right, here we go. Um, so now uh, we have everything in here, and you can see, bring the camera in, so you can see we have salmon, avocado, olive, cucumber. You want to make this spicy? Throw some spice in it. You don't like uh, the, the hard chilies? You want to use sriracha? Use sriracha. Remember, I did this one as a little rogue. I want you to make sure that this is all about you, your flavors, and how you create as to be your own chef, okay? So we've got all those flavors in there. And then the question before on here, uh, it talks about three quarters a cup of uh, lime juice. So remember what I said, bring the camera in guys. So you wanna just be able to just, you see there's just needs a little bit more just enough to cover that fish and that it can sit down in there and start its, uh, its, its uh, denaturing process of breaking down. All right, so that's what that's all about. Chef, we got another question. Sorry, on, all on, right, the, lime, go ahead. on the lime juice. Um, now, yeah. we know uh, in science, not everything uh, lasts very long after you either press it, store it, cut it, right? So we've got it exposed. Yeah. How long would you say that uh, lime juice is good for in the refrigerator? 
You know, uh, for me, I'm saying it's going to be somewhere between four and five days. Uh, that's going to be the end of it after that, okay? I would agree. Things like, I know some people like to keep uh, even leftovers. I wouldn't keep leftovers more than 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, but bacteria can start to grow on food like that. Juices with the acidity, I, I like the, I like your take on that there for a, a few days for life. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's go to plating here. So what we did on this one here uh, is uh, I wanted to show you more of a appetizer that you could do for your friends, which could be a plated course. Uh, obviously, I'm choosing the round ring, but there's also a square ring. Uh, you can make a triangle ring. You can make any ring you, you want. I'm going to use a round. All right, and how are we going to do that? So I am going to grab all of this fish without the juice, take it, and put it in the mold, okay? For those of you looking for it fish, is, we got circles. We got circles. We got circles. <laughs> we got circles. Lots and lots of circles. All right, I won't sing. All right, so now you can see that I'm kind of pushing all this salmon in here, and the avocado is holding that, uh, uh, holding that on. All right, I'm gonna leave that on there for just a minute while I prep the rest of the dish, okay? So now I kinda wanna serve this with a salad and I definitely wanna use some of this beautiful blood orange olive oil that, that we have had here. So kinda fun. The other thing is you could use a tamper to tamp this down. They make tampers, so you can tamp that down, okay? So that's gonna stay like that. Uh, lastly, I wanna do a little salad. So uh, I have a little arugula here, and what I'm going to do is uh, take the arugula, put my finger over this, and just lightly drizzle a couple of drops of some of that beautiful oil. I have just a smidgen of salt, again, crushed through my fingers. So I have my salad is nicely coated. You could see that. So it's got... Oh my God, can you smell that? It is fantastic. I wish I could. Fantastic. Yes, I wish you could too. All right, so lastly here, uh, we're gonna remove our salmon, uh, our, our ring, and then we're gonna take our arugula salad and we're gonna plate it on top of there like that. So we have a nice arugula salad. And then I've cut some scallions here that I call, uh, sort of a sushi scallion. I, I cut them up really fine. I put them in water. And that also gives a nice little touch to the salad, to the salad on top as well. It kind of goes with the dish. So now to finish this, we want to eat it with something. So what I did on the side is I have some fried wonton chips. Now this is a Spanish or, or, uh, origin dish. So this could uh, be uh, fried tortillas. Uh, it could be these wonton chips. And you could just see here, you just stack it up like this and you can take those and eat it with that. And then lastly, and, uh, and finally, uh, we are going to uh, take a spoon and we're going to put a little spoon of this orange oil on there. And we're going to take this and just give it a little extra kick of some orange around there. Just one little half teaspoon. So right there, guys, Beautiful. is your, your salmon uh, plated, your salmon ceviche uh, with some uh, avocado, olive, cucumber, and uh, some chips on the side. It's a fantastic dish to serve everybody. It looks fantastic. And, well, thank you, thank you. And then as you can see, we have our ceviche, our classic ceviche, in the, in the uh, you know, in the reception form. So right there, those are your uh, two styles of ceviche. Enjoy them. Any questions at the end here? Oh yeah, we've got questions. So I'm gonna kind of come up to the top and this might be a little out of order. Um, so one of the questions, um, which actually I might handle this one, will you cook the scallops? So you may have noticed that we didn't use any heat in this presentation because the cooking we did was all through cooking with acid, or I should say cooking, because we use acid to denature the proteins um, and give that texture and color of the, say, a cooked fish or seafood here. So we're using acid to cook with 
not heat. Anything you want to add to that, Chef Michael? No, you did that well. Awesome. All right, so there's another question about um, tangy fruits and other, I see you have a whole bowl full of um, other citrus there. Um, people are asking about what else they might be able to use as far as citrus juices for um, ceviche. Can you cover that? That's a, that is a fantastic question. In fact, you know what? I didn't have it on the recipe and I had my lemon zester out and you could literally take a nice, beautiful lemon and yes, you could cook with uh, uh, lime, lemon, orange, and grapefruit, and any combination uh, therein uh, with all of those different fruits. And then check this out with the camera right here. Uh, you could nicely take this lime and or lemon, look at that, how it just shaves that, just that little bit of lemon right over the top of that dish. Isn't that spectacular? Beautiful. You can see all that little lemon zest that goes on there. Question just came up about where do you get a lemon zester? Uh, this is pretty easy. This is a, uh, this comes from any of the cooking stores and it's called a microplane is what it's called. So if you can't make it to your favorite cooking store, check out your favorite online retailer right now and uh, have it sent right to your house. That's right. That's right. All any right. other last, any other questions? There, there are several questions actually. Um, if you can't get your hands on blood orange oil, um, what are some substitutions? You know what, as I said, when we were putting the blood orange oil in, it could be any of your favorite oils. It could be uh, Meyer, uh, Meyer lemon oil. Uh, it could be, um, you know, uh, your, ex your favorite extra virgin olive oil. I just so happen to like the, uh, the blood orange oil, so. All right, so um, another question here. Um, what is a good substitute for someone who might not eat fish or seafood? <laughs> Uh, I don't have another substitute. We're doing cooking with acidity and seafood. Uh, I don't know of any other substitute for seafood. For, yeah, for this particular dish, um, I'm not sure if there is one. I guess you could try right. something else if you wanted to, just for flavor. Yeah, let them create. Let them get in the kitchen and create, and they can write you back. Beautiful. Um, we, we can look into that. Also, um, so as we're thinking about seafood in particular, there was something I wanted to mention was if you are out looking for your seafood, um, a great resource is Seafood Watch, which is a program actually out of uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium that can help you pick the most sustainable seafood. Um, and when you go to that website, I believe it's seafoodwatch.com, you can just uh, put it in your web browser, it'll come up. Um, it will tell you based on where you live uh, what some of the best options are in your area and it'll give you the best choices then the next best choices if you can't find those so you know is it farm raised is it wild caught etc so seafood watch is a really good choice when you're looking at sustainability options in your seafood um, okay a couple of last questions here um, and they're a little focused on you why are you wearing gloves tonight chef michael that's a great question well, first of all, we've been wearing gloves in the food industry for the last decade, and there is a virus going around. Uh, I was able uh, to take off my mask for the last few uh, 30, 30 minutes. Other than that, I would be wearing a mask. Uh, thank you for that. We appreciate the extra steps for uh, PPE, we call it, personal protective equipment right now um, for social yeah. distancing. And you know, when, when any of our, uh, Sari, any of our events or any of the things we're doing currently, uh, we totally suit up here. We take everybody's temperature, we wear gloves, we wear masks, and uh, we are diligent about uh, keeping it out of, our, uh, out of our nest. Well, we appreciate that very much because it's very important right now to ensure the, the safety and health of all of our community, and hence the reason that the Science Center is not open right now, unfortunately. Um, but Tonight is evidence of how just because the Science Center is closed doesn't mean the science has to stop. Um, so our last question, uh, two last questions, uh, Chef Michael, um, how did you get into um, cooking? How did you become a chef? And any recommendations uh, for somebody who's interested in cooking? Um, well, it was, a long, it was a long time ago I got interested in cooking. Uh, and so I've been cooking now for about 45 years. I've done all different types of cooking. Uh, and as far as somebody wanting to get into it, uh, I think uh, you don't necessarily have to go to school. I didn't go to school. I actually did the School of Hard Knocks. I was a chef's apprentice. I think one of the best ways for somebody to learn is to get into a restaurant or work under a chef 
and do some, you know, uh, cooking is, seems very, uh, you know, fun, and which it is, but it is definitely hard work. And we work over holidays, we work over everything. I'm not trying to scare anybody straight, but I would say get in with a chef that you can get in and work for two or three years by their side, learn what they learn, then you can get out and spread your wings a little bit. That's how what I would do. That's perfect. Uh, and that's actually a perfect segue into our closure tonight uh, because this is a great example. Tonight is a great example of how you can find science anywhere and you can turn it into whatever your passion is. Um, and Chef Michael, thank you so much for sharing your kitchen, your passion, and your recipes with us tonight. We appreciate getting the peek in your kitchen. All right. Well, thank you. And the last little thing I'm going to go off the reservation on here, I'm going to just go ahead and give a fresh squeeze of some of that orange juice that everybody was talking about. So there you go. Now I just kicked it up with a little fresh lemon, so, uh, orange. So uh, enjoy your, uh, your ceviche dishes and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight, taking some time to uh, learn something new, learn a little science. Um, thank you to all of our board members, President's Club members, members, and even new folks that joined us tonight. Um, if you'd like to see more science activities like this and even more, uh, you can check us out on Facebook. You can follow M uh, culinary Concepts um, on Facebook and Twitter as well. Check out our websites respectively. Uh, Arizona Science Center has resources for you on all kinds of science activities, demonstrations, lessons, and even more to keep the science going at home. Uh, and you can check us out at azscience.org. We'll continue to post a uh, follow-up for this, including the recipes on our website as well. And you can also find that on uh, M Catering and M Culinary Concepts website uh, after this event. So again, thank you all for joining us tonight, Chef Michael. One more thank you. Really, I appreciate it. That looks delicious. I can't wait to cook it myself, and we'll see you all next time. Have fun. All right. Take care, everybody. Okay. See you. Bye.